Union UK Crime Book Club. I am um, I'm thrilled. I've waited for this interview for a long time. I've waited my turn. I've paid my dues and now I've got Matt Billingham all to myself for an hour. Hello, Mr Billingham. Hello, Sam. You all right? I'm mm, a bit shaky. I'm okay. good. All right. I'm, I'm very good. Oh, yeah. I've got a thousand questions for you. So, oh, you know, me. Not all right. We've only got an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, introduce yourself for anybody who's been living under a rock. Okay, uh, I'm Mark Billingham and I write crime novels and uh, uh, have been doing so since, blimey, to turn of the century. Um, <laughs> and my latest book is The Murder Book, which came out on Thursday, so just out. And it's the 18th Tom Thorne novel. It's the last Tom Thorne novel for a bit. We'll probably talk about why in a minute. I know. Uh, only for a bit. Um, and yeah, so it sees the return of Thorne after a break because the last book I wrote was a standalone called Rabbit Hole. So it's Thorn is back, and so is one of his old mates, and so is his worst enemy, who has been in three previous books, and he's back with a vengeance in the murder book. So I've actually got them behind me. So we've got Scaredy Cat, um, Death Message, The Bones Beneath, yeah. and now obviously The Murder, and murder book. book. which completes the, that's it, that's it. The story will be finished in this book. Ooh, well, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Oh, great. So um, I already want the next Thorn book. Yeah. I'm not getting one. Well, <laughs> you will, you will, you will, but probably not for a couple of years. Probably not for a couple of years. Uh, next year's book is written and I'm going to write another, and that's a new series, which, again, I'll talk about in a bit. And there's one going to, you know, I'm going to write at least two in that series before I go back to Thorn. But, you know, I am contracted to write another Thorn novel, so there will be one. Um but contracted I, you know, I, to write one more phone? Well, no, because I'm contracted. I, I have a contract at the moment for three more books, and two of them are going to be Miller books. Miller is my new character, yeah. uh, and the third one will be a Thorn book. Uh, and I'm, you know, I've already started thinking about what I'm going to do with him because, you know, the end of the murder book kind of draws a line under a few things. It seemed like a good place to hit the pause button. Mm. A lot of stuff is kind of resolved, so I'm not sure where we're going to find him in uh, in a couple of years. Who he's it's going to be with? Pause, where he's though, going to be? It? It's it's not yeah. a full stop. Yeah. It's definitely a pause. Yeah. Oh, it is a... just a pause. Yeah. We're not going to. The next book's not going to start at his funeral or anything. Although it's quite tempting to write that and send it to my editor just to wait for the email I get back. That gave me actually sweaty hands as soon as you okay. said that. I was like, no, right. no, no, can't okay. do that. Thank no. you, Kaz, for tagging everybody in, and hello to everybody who said hello already. How lovely hello. to have people starting already. So um, I am going to say hello to my mum because my mum will not read gritty crime books. She will not read your books, but she loves it when you're on the telly. So she doesn't read gritty. She'll like Miller. She'll like the Miller books. So they're softer. They are much different in tone, much lighter, uh, funny, I hope. Um, that's the intention anyway. Very, yeah, much lighter, much, much different in tone, not as dark as the Thorn books at all. So... They're safe for your mum. Your mum's the main reason I'm writing them, to be to be honest. There you go. I'll show her this. Okay. She does watch the interviews sometimes. I'm surprised she's not sick of the sound of my voice. And now my husband is, so, you know. Okay. My mum's still, um, yeah, she still likes listening. But she loves it when she sees you on a, you know, anything on the telly. Oh, well, I'm going to so, game show or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are a brilliant quizzer. Oh, I love quizzing. We did love God. you on the chase. I love I'm very quizzing. jealous that you went on the chase. Yeah, the chase, the chase was fun. Uh, the chase was fun, and I nearly blew it. I remember nearly blowing it in the first, in the actual chase. Uh, but then once we got to the final chase, oof, we 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 owned we owned the governess. <laughs> you absolutely did own, yeah. It was great. Um, so I, I really want to talk about Nicklin. Now, obviously, I don't want to give anything away. Yeah. Um, I have no intention of giving any spoilers at all. But it must be a really satisfying thing to write such a well-loved baddie. I mean, he's a terrible human being, but I could is, not he? get enough of him. In fact, I, I was talking to Mike Craven the other day, and I know you saw him last night. Yeah. Um, but we both agreed that The Bones Beneath was our favourite Billingham. Okay. So, well, I, it, it wasn't like when that book finished. And it's not a spoiler to say that at the end of that book, he's out in the world. You know, he's at large. Um, it wasn't like I thought, oh, you know, I'll bring him back eventually. I, I, you know, I kind of thought that was him. I liked the fact that it wasn't all tied up and there was this figure that occasionally Thorne would still think about. I mean, he would mm. still be mentioned 
in yeah. books. Thorne would kind of wake up sweating, thinking about him, wondering where he was. Well, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, you would. You absolutely would. But I did get, I get, I got loads and loads of emails going. When is Nicklin back? When he, when are we going to see Nicklin again? And so I when only I sent thinking, about five thousand of them. So but when I, when I, when I started thinking about this book, I knew this was going to be the book where he was going to come back, and I just had to figure out how and what he would be up to and what his game plan was. He's always got a plan. Um, mm. And as soon as I figured out what that was, yeah, he was he's such fun to write. I mean, it's such a kind of cliche to say the devil has the best tunes, but you know, much as I love writing Thorn and I love writing Thorn and Hendrix and I like writing Nicola Tanner and I love all that stuff. Mm. When I get when it gets to a Nicklin scene, I'm like, here we go. I, I kind of know it's and and it probably says something bad about me that I like being inside his head. You know, I kind of I enjoy that. It's like an acting, it's like being an actor and getting to play. You know, Richard the Third or something, and getting to play the real baddie. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It must have been a lot of pressure. Did it feel like more pressure to bring him back? Um, I suppose it, there was a bit of pressure in that I sort of knew this was going to be the resolution of things. Uh, I didn't quite know how it was going to end or anything mm. like that, but I wanted this to be, you know, this was the the Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty coming together at the Reichenbach Falls. This was going to be uh, everything getting resolved. Which is like I said, which is why at the end of it, it feels like a good place just to hit pause briefly, because it's not like there's things left at the end of this where you're going, but 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 it's kind of a, a you know draws a line under a lot of issues, not not just Nicklin, but the the secret that has bound Thorn and Tanner and Hendricks together for yeah. the last three three or four books that is getting sorted. Um, so yeah, I can I can pick up Thorn in a completely different place. Um, I don't quite know where he's going to be come the next book, whether he's going to be, is he going to be back with Helen? I don't know. I haven't quite, I've got, I've got a, at least a year to think about it before I start writing it. So, When you get reader feedback, do you ever take any of it on board? Oh God, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, funnily enough, a, 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 a blogger, I think it was yesterday, was talking about the murder book. And I'd written a really nice review, which was very lovely, but had, but had come up with a little headline. I talked about this at the event with Mike Cross even last night she said the past isn't just haunting thorn it's hunting him and that is such a great shout line that I, thought, I wish i'd genius. That. isn't that brilliant i really yeah. wish i'd talk about that. um so thank you for that um i mean you know i don't take it on board if they say oh you know thorn shouldn't be with that person he should be living with that person or you know he should but but if, if we, you know when readers were saying things like oh, where's dave holland i really want to see holland again what's happened to yeah. him um, that I made was me thrilled to think, bits to see Dave. Yeah, that, that made me think about that because I, I just thought I'm not writing about him anymore. He's just gone, and then so I started asking myself, "Where's he gone, and how can I bring him back?" Um, and and that and the and the emails about Nicklin, yeah, it just really made me think it would be great. It'd be great to bring those characters back in the same book. No, I absolutely. I mean, a book is a book isn't doesn't exist until it's read, and 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 when it's read, it's owned by the reader every bit as much as it is by me. Uh, or any other writer whose book mm. has been read. <clears throat> and anything a reader thinks is completely valid. You know, even if they, even if they, you know, I mean, Rabbit Hole was was, was quite a Marmite book with a lot of readers um, because it was such a different book and it was a first person narrative and it had nothing to do with Thorne and that first person, Alice, was, you know, didn't suffer fools and, and could be a bit annoying and very sarcastic and very stubborn and all that stuff. I mean, I loved her and I loved spending time with her. Um, mm. And so, but it's one of those books where it's the only book of mine where if you look at reviews, will go just the, my book of the year. What a brilliant book to absolute rubbish. It's real. And do you know what? That's made that really made me think. Yeah, I, that's what I, that's the kind of reaction I wanted. You know, you don't want you don't want a book to go. Yes, yeah, all right. Two stars, three stars. It's all right. Mm. I want a book that's five stars or one star. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, you know, I. I I know going back to the murder book and bringing Thorn back will will make a lot of readers happy. They won't they won't be those the same miserable buggers who didn't like Rabbit Hole. And uh, <laughs> and I think they're you know they they get Nicklin back and yeah you know I'm 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 very happy with how it's going so far anyway. Glad to hear it. I was yeah. Just, there's so many things that. Me and Kaz always say this when we're interviewing anybody. We always say there's so many things that I'd love to discuss with you. And we can't talk about half of it. Oh, like, because so, yeah, spoilers. Yeah, tricky. It's very tricky. It is very tricky. Um, 
I mean, what can we say? There's a, <laughs> you know, there are twists and there are turns, and you know, uh, there's a big finish. <laughs> <laughs> that is the understatement of yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to read it. The millennium read it. so far. <laughs> Um, I want to talk to you about my favourite, favourite, favourite character. Obviously, Nicklin's one of them. Obviously, I adore Thorne. This must be a character that you get asked about a lot. Based on a real person, you went to her wedding. Um, Christine Treasure? Oh, we haven't seen... We haven't... We, she's not been around for a while, has she? She's not, but Again, no. she, is, she is completely based on a real person uh, who was one of the police officers who got in touch with me many years ago to say, you know, come out with uniform, come out on a sort of ride along. So I have, I've had a couple of nights, you know, night shifts in the back of a police car with these two officers, one of which was the officer who became Christine <laughs> Treasure, uh, whose name is not a million miles from Christine Treasure, I'll tell you that. Um, and she was just amazing. And well, her and her partner were amazing. And just those two trips almost generated two whole books and certainly generated stories for loads of books. The whole idea of putting Thorne back into uniform, which happened in a book called The Dying Hours, came from them. Uh, they just said, why don't you put Thorne back into uniform? And I said, well, how could they do that? How could I do that with it and still being an inspector? And I said, well, uh, you know, if he if he messes up badly enough, he just gets bumped back down to uniform, still as an inspector. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is in a Chinese restaurant in Croydon at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the shift. Um, and they also just told me some stories, which just, you go, oh, my God, that's so good. And some of the stuff I saw just on those shifts, I mean, you know, she was filthy. I mean, she was absolutely filthy. <laughs> she is you pure know. filth, and we're here for it. We absolutely you were, love you it. were filth. You were. You'd be driving along, and she'd be just looking out the window going, whoa, you know, at, at whatever woman was passing or, <laughs> you know, and just farting and just, you know, she was just an amazing character. And she loved she loved the character that I based on her. Pretty, I didn't have to do much. It was just her, pretty much. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know when. I don't know when or if she'll be back. But that's a that's a good thing. I should bring her back. I should bring you her. should bring her back. And if yeah. I'm the person that instigates that, then yeah. Okay. Okay. That, <laughs> that's great. Um, right. Has anybody ever come to you on the flip side of that question? Has anybody ever come to you and said you've named a character in your book my name when it's nothing to do with them? But has anybody ever come to you and said, "Have you met any real life Stuart Nicklins? Uh Well, no. I was. Uh, oh, I, I, uh, several Stuart Nicklins write to me. Uh, I was at school with somebody called Nicklin. He wasn't called Stuart, um, but I was at school with a Nicklin. And I that, I always wanted to use that name because he was a kind of slightly wild kid, mm. slightly a wild and unpredictable kid. Uh, and I wanted to use his name. Oh, God, plenty of people. Uh, there are plenty of people called Phil Hendricks who write to me and Stuart Nicklin. And uh, a woman wrote to me today with all these bizarre coincidences in the murder book about how... Uh, her parents lived on the road where one of the killings happens in in the murder book. And she was like, and I lived on that street and that, and it's like, it's all getting a bit too close for comfort now. It's getting a bit scary. Uh, and just, you know, you, those weird coincidences happen all the time. And, of course, people get people want you to use their names. Yeah, they want that's to, true. They want, you know, will you kill off my husband? Will you do this? Can I be in a book as a horrible baddie or whatever it is? And it used to be an easy thing to do. And you you would give those things away as prizes uh, or you'd auction them off for charity, you know, your mm. name in a book. But now it's got quite complicated. Now it's not that easy anymore. There are umpteen forms you have to fill in uh, for your publisher that that because because you know the people have to it's almost like the people that do that let you use their names then get a say in what you do with the character and then you just go i, I can't do that mm, yeah I can't no. Actually say, you know no i object to you using my name because if somebody just says if you know yes here's my name use it then you can use it in any way you see fit they can't mm. then object and go but hang on you've killed me or you've made me a sex worker or you've made me a psychopath or you made me whatever you go well that that was the deal but if that if that's off the table, if it starts to become complicated, it's kind of easier not to do it. Um, so yeah. I, haven't, I haven't done that for a while. But, I, yeah, I do get emails from people who go, you know, why am I, why am I a uniformed constable in Croydon or whatever it might be? Yeah. I mean, you know, and that's going to happen if you just use ordinary names, you know, unless you start calling everybody, you know, Felicia Clutterbuck or whatever it might be. You're going to get people getting in touch because they've got the same name, you know. 
there's a line in the book and I wrote it down because I knew I'd forget. Okay. Um, do you share, I was going to ask you, do you share thorns? And this is the line that I wrote down, juvenile sense of humour, as Melita puts it. Um, <laughs> I chuckled when the pub was called the Spread Eagle. I'm 40 years old and I chuckled. It's a real pub, Sam. I know, there's loads of them. And it doesn't normally make me chuckle, but in this it did do loads of things that made me laugh. It's a real me. pub in Camden and uh, they really do the most fabulous sausage rolls and scotch eggs. Uh, which is why Thorn and Hendricks... Are they those fancy, huge scotch eggs that you have to cut in half and share? Yeah, they're, and they're homemade. You know, they're brilliant homemade scotch eggs, and they just sit on the bar under a kind of domed thing, and mm. these beautiful homemade sausage rolls. Uh, and I've done quite a few kind of interviews in there, and, uh, yeah, I always will have a sausage roll and a scotch egg. So I, I had to have Sean, Thorn and Hendricks share share one of those in the Spread Eagle. But, yeah, you've clearly got a juvenile sense of humour as well. I absolutely have. Have you not? Oh God, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And so, so I think I think the bit you're referring to is when Melita is telling Thorne about one particular client of hers and what his sexual preference. Uh, are. Yeah. And uh, you know, Thorne makes a really bad pun and and just thinks it's <laughs> uh, and she goes, "I wish I'd never told you about juvenile sense of humour." Yeah, yeah. Of course. I'm impressed that you remember that because how long ago did you write this? Well, this is the thing I was talking about this earlier. It's very weird when so. Okay, so the murder book would have been delivered, you know, towards the end of last year. No, no, what am I talking about? Earlier than that. And mm -hmm. since then, I've written a whole other book. Uh, and, and I'm still talking about Rabbit Hole, because Rabbit Hole's not long out in paperback. But obviously yeah. now I'm writing the murder book because it's just out. But I'm also on the final edits of next year's book. So that's rattling around my head. Um, so it gets quite hard to go, hang on, which book am I talking about? What character? Thankfully, in this case, they're three very different books. Rabbit yeah. Hole is standalone. Murder Book is a Thorn novel, and the book whose title I am not revealing yet, that's coming out next year, is a is a Miller book. So it's a completely different character. Although Mr. Thorn maybe gets the slightest there's there's a reference to him in there somewhere, which readers will readers will know who I'm talking about, but it's <laughs> not his book. It's not his book. Fair enough. Um have any has anybody ever written to you and said that they've used one of your books or characters in their own book. And I asked this for a reason. I wrote a short story and in the short sto story, somebody gets battered with Crybaby, massive hardback that they're reading when somebody tries to attack them. And they absolutely clobber him with it, which I was really, really pleased with. Have you had any things like that where maybe friends of yours or authors have mentioned one of your books or oh, anything I, like that? I, I've been a character in I was a character in a uh, Karen Slaughter novel. Can't remember which which of Karen's book that was. She just enjoyed doing. She just enjoyed. It, it was some weedy police officer with a with a terrible ringtone on his phone, something like that. And she just she you know the officer was just called Mark Belling and just for Karen's amusement. Uh, and and a few writers have done that. The best example of it I've ever seen is there's uh, a Michael Connolly book where Harry Bosch pulls up at a set of traffic lights and a, ca a car is opposite him at another set of traffic lights. And it's a very particular kind of car, a yellow car. And if you've read the books, you know that that car is being driven by Elvis Cole, who is Robert Crace's detective. Uh, just because they live in the kind of same bit of the city, the same, you know. And it's just a little nod. It's just a little nod and a wink that Harry Bosch and Elvis Cole these two kind of iconic detectives from completely different series, just mm. kind of nodding at each other at traffic lights. And I love that because, because to a reader who hasn't read any of those books, it doesn't mean anything, but it's an extra little thing. It's a little Easter egg, isn't it? Um, for people who've read, who've read both those authors. So that, you know, I, I like doing that kind of thing. I mean, in terms of actual crossover books, you get asked this a lot. You get asked, oh, why, you know, why don't you write a book with Peter James so, you know, Roy Grace and Tom Thorne work together? Or why don't you write a book with Michael Connolly so Tom Thorne works with Harry Bosch on something? And it, and it all sounds great, but it would be a nightmare. It'd I mean, be it, impractical, wouldn't it? It would be impractical because how do you do it? Who writes what scenes? Where is it set? Is, is Tom Thorne solving a murder on his holidays? I mean, how does it work? Um, and also, it would, they would be terrible. I mean, it's the kind of thing you can do in a little short story anthology or, you know, whatever it might be. But, uh, yeah, uh, as a novel idea, it's not it's not a goer, I don't think. Um, we I had quite a lot of response to the um, the photograph that I shared of us. So I met oh, you yeah. at um, 
water stones on Deansgate in Manchester. Okay. And um, that was, I can't actually remember when, it was a good few years ago. And it was the well, first book signing I, I'd been to as an adult. I saw that. the photograph and I was holding a copy, or you were holding a copy, of a book called Love Like Blood. Yeah, and that is going was. back... That is going back five or six years. Well, you tell me when was that book? Yeah, that's it. When was that book published? Um, so, uh, uh, twenty seventeen. Yeah, there you go. Five years ago. How is twenty seventeen? Five years ago. So I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? Signed copy. It's ridiculous. There you go. A little happy and yeah, sad that was five years. Mirrors on blood. Happy and sad faces. Yeah, which I can also do in the murder book. Of course, it's always oh. nice to have two O's. But you. I've been doing that in the murder book signing. <laughs> We've just had a comment that said, bit late, sorry, great night in Warwick last night. I'm wondering if that's Lucy. I have got my phone at the side of me because it just says Facebook user. So, no, that was oh, Mike no, Hemming. It's not... it's not Lucy, it's Mike Hemming. Okay. So I know Mike can, I believe it was his wife great. came with you, with him it, it, last it night. Was a, it was a really lovely event with, uh, with Mike last night. It was good fun. We... Uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to have events. You know, it's nice to have two writers and there's an interviewer. There's somebody moderating. I'll go, Mark, tell me about Mike. And it was just me and Mike chatting. Yeah, and actually just from the moment we started speaking, we didn't shut up. Yeah. We just didn't shut up for 45 minutes. Um, and that's nice. And I think I think audiences like to see people just having a chat. I mean, obviously, if it doesn't work, if there isn't a kind of rapport between <laughs> yeah. them, it can be really boring. But... You know, I've known Mike for a while, so it was it was easy, and we just had a we had a really good night. It was really good fun. Nice. I have actually his books on the shelf behind me. He told me my bookshelves are ratty, and I needed to tidy up. Uh, it's not really yeah. going to happen, Mike. Sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> Should see the okay. rest of my okay. office. Is your are you really quite tidy when you're writing, or is there just stuff everywhere? No, well, you can. I mean, you can see. I'm I'm quite organised, really. I'm certainly organised about where I put all my like Beatles dolls. Where there's some Beatles dolls up there. There's my little yellow submarine. Hats are quite organised. Books are organised, of course, and they're chronological. Um, yeah, no, I'm quite organised. CDs all lined up there. No, I'm not. I'm not untidy at all. I'm actually very anal. You know, very anal about organising. I am everywhere else, but in my office, it's just my space. The problem is, yeah. you can see it from everywhere else in the house. So um, it's my space, but. We try not to look directly at it. Okay. It's organised chaos, okay. basically. So, okay. Well, then that's good. That's a good thing. I know that's where everything right. is. I know what everything yeah. is. Yeah. No, that's so. the most important thing. You can put your hand on something quickly. So. Okay. I'm when just you know people's comments. Yeah, Ooh. there's all sorts. Um, Somebody's just gone post... marmite. <laughs> One of them's come what? I don't know. I mean, oh, you know, I, I mentioned okay. that, Yeah, I mentioned, so, I mentioned oh, Rabbit Hole. Oh, you mentioned in about um, Rabbit Hole, weren't you? So that's... And Lucy wants to know why I chose to narrate my audiobooks myself rather than get an actor <laughs> to do them. Well, do you know what? It, it happened by accident because right at the beginning I was asked to do them because I'd been an actor. So people said, do you want to narrate your own audiobooks? And I went, God, no, that's a difficult thing <laughs> to do. No, that's I can't do that. So various actors did it. And this is back in the day when the books were abridged. They used to be abridged because they weren't downloads. They were like CDs and cassettes. And, you know, unless you wanted them to be, you know, that thick, they would mm. get abridged and they'd be done by actors. And sometimes they were good and sometimes they were bad. And then a really good actor called Rob Glenister, Robert Glenister did them for a few years and they were great. And then what happened was when the Thorn series got made on telly, they wanted David Morrissey to do the audiobooks. And David said, yeah, fine. It was all lined up for him to do the audiobook. Mm. I forget which one it was. And then, you know, like a week before recording, he got a movie or something and he couldn't do it. So they immediately went back to Robert Glenister, by which time Robert Glenister had got a movie and he couldn't do it. And like I got a call going, well, do you think, could you? <laughs> um, so I went in and did it. And I, I, you know, I suppose that was about 10 years ago. And um, I really enjoyed it. And I've done them. I haven't done them all ever since. I've done the, I've done the ones that aren't... Uh, I mean, I couldn't do Rabbit Hole. That was brilliantly done by Maxine Peake, who was I just... I love Maxine Peake. She yeah. was, I mean, you I, must have been thrilled uh, when Maxine agreed. Oh, my God. I, mean, I was hearing her voice when I was writing it. I honestly kind of heard oh. that voice. And so when they said, oh, who should we get to narrate it? I went, well, you could ask Maxine Peake. Lo and, lo and behold, she did it, and she was absolutely brilliant. Um, and there's a couple I haven't done, and Cry Baby we did as a kind of ensemble thing with David Morrissey and Robert Glenister and whatever, because that was the 20th book. 
Uh, but murder book I've done myself. And yeah, I kind of like it. It's three days just, it works as a proofread for me. It's three days when I have to read the, the book out very slowly and yeah. very carefully. And that's when I spot any last minute errors or mistakes or typos or anything like that. So it's good. It's a good, it's good fun. Hard work, but but I enjoy it. We actually had um, a, a, a comment from Abby who said, come on, let us get a word in Edgeways or something to that effect. Am I going to let anybody else ask a question? No. No, I am. Of course I, might, I am. I don't know. I figured I'd kind of do the first half an hour and then I'd add in my own questions with everybody else's. So, um, okay. okay. But we're already up to the half an hour. So, yeah, that was from Lucy, who you met last night. I did. We love Lucy. Um, so, oh, Andrew has said, um, red faceless and in the dark. My imagination was really there when reading in the dark. A really great journey, Mark, from Andrew. Um, I did watch a TV adaptation. Is it called Into the Dark or In the Dark? The TV no, In version? the Dark. Yeah, that in was... The dark. Yeah, that was a weird one, which which confused a lot of people because... I loved uh, it. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was great. I mean, In the Dark, which is what the series was called, uh, it was BBC series, was a mashup of two books, uh, In the Dark and Time of Death. And mm -hmm. Time of Death is a thorn book and In the Dark isn't. Uh, but they sort of mashed the two of them together and took Thorn out of uh, the time of death bit of it. Uh, and it was a, the series was about Helen Weeks. The series, she yeah. was the main character. Uh, really, really brilliantly played by uh, Mayanna Buring. And um, yeah, it was an odd one because it was just like this mashup of two different books. But I mean, that's the way, that's the way TV works. It's, it's, it's kind of odd. Um, and the new series I'm writing is came from telly it's an um i was i was asked to write an original detective series for the bbc a couple of years ago as a vehicle for a comedian for a well-known comedian and so i wrote it and it's still in development i mean it still might happen but it's been like two years now i mean mm. television moved so slowly uh and eventually i thought sod it i'm gonna write the books because i've got this character in my head i know who he is i've lived with him for a couple of years uh, and all the people around him and, and the story and stuff. So, yeah, the first Miller book is basically based on this TV series, which still may or may not, may not happen. I mean, if it happens, great, instant TV adaptation of the book. But even if it doesn't happen, uh, the book will still come out. But, yeah, that started for TV, and it's it was kind of, kind of a fun thing, um, writing a TV script that I, that I then had to turn into a novel. I've never done that before, but we'll see how it turns out. I mean, you've worked in all areas of TV now. There must be so many jobs that you've done. Are there more that you want to do? Um, do you know what I'd really love to do is have a radio show. I think that's the only the only kind of thing I haven't done. Um, you know, I've done documentaries and I've done mm. dramas and kids' telly and animation and all sorts of stuff. I remember the kids' telly. The yeah. I would... But I would. When you just used to think, why did you look so familiar? And then I realised. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Happy days. Uh, no, I lo and I loved all that. I loved all that. But the idea of having your own radio show, just maybe once a week, once a week, mm. for a couple of hours, where I get to play music that I want and have people phoning in and have guests. And, you know, I love to do it. I mean, I've done stuff like on, on, on BBC Radio 6 Music. They do a show called Paperback Writers, which I've done a couple of times where you get an hour. I've got an hour and I can just play anything I want. And then talk about them, and and there were songs that meant something to me, or w inspired things I've written about, or whatever. And that was joyous, and that and I love radio. I think radio is fantastic. So yeah, if anybody's watching wants to give me a radio show, I'll very happily do that. When it came to the TV um, shows, I've not watched the Thorn series purely because I didn't know if I'd be able to go back to reading afterwards. Yeah. I, um, there's so many films that I've watched where I then haven't been able to concentrate on the book because you're constantly comparing and I can't switch it off. However, with In the Dark, um, I watched that and it was only when Helen's name came up that I thought, oh, this is a thorn, kind of, this is Mark Billingham. Obviously, it's mm. not a thorn, but this is Mark Billingham. Can I carry on watching this? Is it going to put me off? But I couldn't stop watching it. And it didn't put me off. I don't, it's, it's not kind of crossed over. It's not... So maybe I should actually watch the. Um, it's, such, it's such a difficult one, Sam. Sometimes, I mean, I think what is important is that it doesn't change the way the writer sees their character. And you know, I never, I never 
think of David Morrissey when I write the Thorn books. I, mm. I never do. Like, even when I was writing the one when he was playing him on telly, and it didn't didn't occur to me at all because I'm inside his head. I'm, you know, I'm look. I know what he thinks. I know what his opinions are about things. What he looks like doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, <clears throat> it's probably very hard to to read an Inspector Morse book these days without thinking of John Thor. Uh, to read, yeah. I mean, funnily enough, the, this happened to me most recently with with Mick Heron. I was reading the new Mick Heron book while I was watching Slow Horses on TV at mm -hmm. literally at the same time. And it did, you know, I you know, got in bed and opened the book just after I'd watched an episode. And I am now kind of seeing Gary Oldman as Jackson Lamb. And, but it doesn't, the books are just still every bit as brilliant. Um, I, I, I think it depends on the kind of reader you are. If, it's gonna, if, it, if you think it's going to spoil it for you, and it might spoil it for you because you go, oh, that's not like the book. And I know some people hate that. You just go, that's so different from the book. But it has to be. It has to be different, you know. It doesn't always bother me when things are different. There's one book, and I won't say what it was, but and it's not one of yours. There's one book in particular that I, it was a huge book. This is why I won't name it, because I'll just get people messaging me lots of nasty things, probably. But um, I hated the ending in the book, but the TV version mm -hmm. was brilliant and exactly kind of how I'd pictured it. But that's really the only time. I mean, I do like it when things are pretty accurate. But at the same time, it's nice to see what other people's version of it, you know, what their vision is and where they take it. I think I know what book you're talking about, and we'll talk about it when we're off the air. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Do I it, sleep it in my hat? Of course I don't sleep in my hat. Who is that? I, just, I don't need an excuse to get That's Mike hat coming out. again. <laughs> it's hot weather, Mike. When, it, when, the, when the hot weather, you know, and I do have hair. Look, there's hair. But I, lo I love putting a... It's, I, I call it my holiday hat. It's my summer hat. It comes out in nice weather. But there you go. The only hat I've got, see if I can reach it, and it's full of um, past competition winners because it needs MCM. This was a hat that one of my kids wore in um, a play they were in in primary school. Okay. They were Scrooge. Or is it like a so top hat? Start. Is it like a top yeah. hat? Sure. It's yeah. a top hat. Okay, let's like, Abraham Lincoln. like Abraham Lincoln or something. <laughs> Um, oh, Lucy's saying she remembers when um, she, obviously Maxine Peake, first appeared in Dinner Ladies with Victoria Wood. There's yeah. somebody I, I would love to have just sat down with as well, Victoria Wood. Well, I, 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 I once made a fool of myself with Victoria Wood. I, um, we went to the same, we both did drama at Birmingham University. She was a couple of years ahead of me. Uh, and me and a few other students, after we left university, formed a theatre company, which mm. toured around like the Midlands for a while. Kind of, uh, you know, you know, the series League of Gentlemen. You, there's a, there's a theatre company in that called Legs Akimbo, who are kind of could really write on. And really, we were that theatre company. We were so kind of up ourselves. We wore dungarees and did shows in shopping centres. And we were anyway. Oh, it was awful. But we were once doing a show at, in the studio theatre at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, and she was in the main theatre. And we were all in the bar together afterwards, and we were all sitting there, and she was just minding her own business. I mean, let's go up and let's go up and say, oh, you know, oh, oh hello, Victoria. We we were at Birmingham University Drama Department, and you were at Birmingham University, and it was just a horrible kind of. <laughs> she just looked at us like, and you know, not she wasn't being horrible or anything. She'd just done her show, and she was relaxing, having a drink, and these idiots come up to her and started. But no, she was a, an absolute genius, comedy genius. Yeah. Grew up yeah. watching. I mean, we've got videotapes of um, different shows that me and my mum would sit down and watch. Yeah, the, yeah. The amount of laughs and the amount of the amount of songs I could. I, I won't. But the amount yeah. of songs of hers I could just reel off now. Yeah. Just still from watching them. I, I have watched them again over years. Not the videos now, sadly. Um, I don't think I own a video recorder now. No, who does? Well, I'm sure some people do, yeah. I think my mum and dad do. Maybe I'll have to go around there and watch them. We still talk about showing our age, isn't it? But, or showing my age. But I still talk about videoing things. I just go, oh, did you video? I, I say video. that all the time. Why do you video anything these days? They're just there all the time. You download them. But I, I always say, oh, we must video that. But there we go. Um, yeah, yeah, no. There's I all never, kinds I never, of things. I never got to see Victoria Wood live. I did see Jasper Carrot live. Mm -hmm. Uh but yeah, oh, she was so brilliant, and also could could do really serious, moving drama as well. Do you know what I mean? She was just yeah. so incredibly talented. But um, absolutely, no, that, that connection with Maxine Peake, it was so. She was, I mean, 
if you like listening to audiobooks, listen to Rabbit Hole. Not because of the book, but just her performance is just unbelievably brilliant. Unbelievably brilliant. Aggie's asking, where's Grandad's hat? I can't reach it from here. I've not um, I've not put it back on the shelf where it goes yet. So we did a live event, our first on stage in front of an audience live event on Saturday. Okay. And um, shaking like a leaf the whole time. Managed yeah. to do it. But I took my granddad's hat with me because it was in Wigan, which is where he was from. Okay. So I took that and had that on the stage at the side, which one of the authors had suggested. And that was very nice. But what I didn't take, let me see if I can get this without... Oh, no, I have put the hat back. Hold on. i put my ears back in now. Um, so, granddad's hat. Nice. Just a flat cap. Yeah. He must have had a teeny head. I tried it on once. Didn't fit. But I've okay. also got, and most of the uh, most of the members who and my friends who watch a lot know this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Oh, you can't you need to turn it around. That. I can see my name, and then wishing you a very happy a very birthday, happy... Sam. Okay, when was, so that? This, what year was that? This is a tweet from you. Okay, first of February, twenty seventeen. Okay. Um, I was having a a mm, rough time my husband okay. messaged you on twitter and said it's my wife's birthday can you send her a tweet so he printed this off and brought it me after work framed oh, no. so there you go so at some there point you. when i see you again i might get you to sign it okay <laughs> so now i don't know where to put these because like i said my office is um yeah. So have you got anything like that from authors that you admire? Maybe not tweets that you've printed off, because now I say it out loud, it goes from sweet to stalkerish a bit. No, no, no. It is such a weird thing. I mean, um, for, for, the, for, for the couple of years before I got published, maybe three or four years before I got published, um, I was doing what you were doing. I was interviewing authors. I was writing about crime. I was trying to just trying to get in, find some way to get into the sort of world of it. I would go to the festivals and hang around. And, I, and for various magazines back then, I had to go and interview uh, Michael Connolly. I had to go and interview Ian Rankin, um, who were like massive, you know, huge kind of heroes to me, you know. And I remember turning up at the offices of uh, like Orion Publishers uh, with a little dictaphone, one of those old-fashioned little dictaphones, and sitting there shaking like a leaf going, um, well, Michael, um, I really enjoyed your, you know, and ditto Ian, and now the two of them are mates. It's a weird, it's a yeah. weird thing. And I think it's testament to how kind of, you only have to be with it in that community for five minutes to feel really welcome. You know, by the time you've written a book or two, yeah. like, oh, you know, come on in. You know, it's, it's, it's so weird. Uh, and I still felt like that when I, when I met Elmore Leonard, you know, for the, and, and again, I'm like, and, and not just me, every other writer, every other writer there is going, <laughs> When when there was a writer called James Crumley, sort of legendary American crime writer, and at about Chicon World Mystery Convention, must have been at least ten years ago, he was like holding court. He was quite old and not very well, and he was holding court and and gathered around him almost at his feet were every major crime writer you can imagine, all sat there, kind of you know it was probably their last chance to see him. But when you see something like that, you realise how it just. It goes on. It's passed on. It's, you know what I mean. It's uh, there's all there's always the, the the day you don't have heroes. The day you stop being impressed by certain people is the day. Well, it's the day you just become a bit of a twat, frankly. I think. <laughs> Can I say twat? I said it. There you go. You did. Apologies for the language, but there you go. No, um, I never swear on camera. Okay. Um, and I drink, this is lager in a mug. I always tell everybody what I've got in it. It says, this was a, a gift from a friend. Although the voices okay. aren't real, we've got some pretty good ideas. Right. And um, the reason for that is I worked in a school for a long time, so I never wanted the kids to see a picture of me with kind of a wine glass or a glass of beer. Or, so it's always in a mug just so they can't, couldn't use the, the picture. But now yeah. I've got so many nice mugs that people sent me because of that. And this one is the biggest one. Okay. So, okay. Good for lager. Um, let's, let's compare then, my. What have I got? Oh. I've got my. Now I'm trying to remember where that was from. Got evidence that was from like a, a a crime museum somewhere, and this this from the Johnny Cash the Johnny Cash Museum. Nice. So that's my Johnny Cash mug in Nash Nashville, Tennessee, which just has pens in it that I don't use. 
But you've got to have a bag full of pens, haven't you, on a desk? That's what you've got to have, but there you go. Yeah, I've got um, I've got a really nice... I don't actually... I've not unpacked it. I know exactly where it is. I've got a really nice mug that one of the um, the kids' parents got me, and it's got Mrs Brownlee on it, and it's all pink sparkly glitter. That was used for uh, for pens, because obviously you can't use something that nice. Yeah. There's just no way. I have got one, um, a UK Crime Book Club one with bookmarks in it, because I won't okay. use mine either. Cass thinks I'm mad, but I won't use that mug. Okay. And then, I was, yeah, it's things like that. I managed to somehow come away from that event last night without any UK Crime Book Club bookmarks. I don't know how that happened. Well, um, if you want I some, I can send some on. Yeah. Well, I, I guess there's going to be somebody at Harrogate giving them out. We'll, yeah, uh, me. Here we go. I'll, I'll be giving them out at Harrogate. Kaz will be giving them out. Yeah, there'll be loads. Yeah, Caroline, we've got an awful Caroline. lot of them. Yeah. Um, I don't know who said... Oh, it was Mike Hemmen that said we don't have hair, so if you want your hat. Um, Charlotte McFall's come in, just come in and said hi. Hello, Charlotte. So Charlotte's hey, Charlotte. um, just written, I believe. Charlotte, have you finished writing your debut? Let me know. Let me know where you're up to. Okay. Um, right, I made a note of something here. There's some interesting ways to make extra money in your book for um, <laughs> the juvenile comes out of me again. Yeah. Um, I don't fancy whipping old blokes for a few quid, but what else did you find? And did you make up instant whip as the name of the company? That I took the rest of the day off when I came up with that joke. I would have done as well. But it is it is for it is for readers of a certain age. It's for readers who do remember instant whip. Some people I won't. Instant whip. I thought it was genius that you used it in that way. But I did. Oh my god! I mean, I did get a, a tour. I was taken on a tour of the dark web, which oh, is. Oh, the a, tour was real. Oh yeah, the tour was real. I, I did get shown that. Uh, obviously, it's all virtual. I'm not, <laughs> they don't take you anywhere. There isn't like a door. Um, but through through various you know, police contacts. Uh, I was eventually put in touch with, uh, I mean, Graham Bartlett, who I'm sure you know, was, was very helpful. Um, I worked on his um, his books. Yeah. Well, Graham, so, Graham's brilliant. Yeah. And uh, his own debut is out. Uh, is it out yet? I think it's just coming out, actually. Next That's week. Fab. And um, so Graham put me in touch with a colleague of his who was a sort of uh, an expert in these things who took me on a tour of the dark web. Mm. And... You know, there's one thing that I talk about in the book where Thorne thinks that he comes across this place on the dark web uh, where well, basically for for shockingly small amount of money, somebody will destroy another person's reputation for you. Is it like you know, 500 quid or something? Yeah, something just outrageous. They will do, you know, is there someone you want to get your own back on? I will do this to them, that to them, all all kind of online, but destroy them. I mean, kind of destroy them. And and so, of course, Thorne can't resist thinking of a... He's got a huge list of people that he, <laughs> he'd happily pay that for. Well, but yeah, there, all. <laughs> yeah, but there are some... Yeah, there's some fairly dreadful stuff on there. Um you know, you don't you don't have to really make make up stuff. It's all just out there, Sam. All that. I mean, apart from I did make That's up instantly. Although I'm sure such I'm sure such a website exists. Uh, I just had to give it. I a didn't want to Google it. It's one of those that I thought I'm not going to Google it. I'm just going to ask you on camera. I'm not googling that. I'm putting yeah. that. Yeah. The yeah. amount of things that I have googled though. But um, yeah. Sarah Rackford said instant whip. Do you mean angel delight? Sarah, you must be no. Oh, they're different things. You must be they're so different. young. <laughs> yeah, I mean, much as much as I loved Butterscotch Angel Delight, and who doesn't know, Instant Wit was sort of it was somehow smoother than Angel Delight. Um, I wonder when they stopped making it. Smoother and Inst shinier, I, yeah, I feel it like kind of it tasted smooth. and looked yeah. shiny. It was great. It, I mean, it, do you know what? If I had a bowl of it now, I'd probably go. Eh. But as a kid, oh my god, Instant well, Wit was fabulous, fabulous thing. I do know Sarah, but I've no idea how old you are, Sarah. But yeah, I'm guessing I've got a bit of a bit of years on you. Um, I've just turned something over. <laughs> I wrote down as decompressed as a new. Well, that made me howl laughing. Good. So oh, I don't do you know think what? that's a spoiler at all, is it? It's just a conversation that they're having. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I hope there are, I mean, there are so many more jokes in the book that's coming because, I mean, I have to hold back with, with, with you know, ha 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 things in the Thorn books because Thorn isn't really. You know, he makes he has a couple of little wisecracks with Melita and he, he meant the scenes with him and Hendrix, I don't mind the dark humour in those. But it's not, you know, he's not a wisecracking kind of comedy cop, you know. Uh, but Miller is. Um, so I haven't had to hold back at all. If I've thought of a joke, it's gone in. 
Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. I don't know what readers are going to make of it. Um, you know, the book is still dark in places. I mean, it's a, it, it's Miller is the way he is because he's lost someone. Miller is the way he is because he's grieving. Uh, and he just deals with grief in a very strange way. Um, I don't think there is a way to deal with it. You know, there's no roadmap for yeah. it. Everybody grieves in a different way. And he's right in the middle of it. And his way of dealing with it is to sort of say the unsayable and just behave in a very strange manner. And so I've had so much fun with him as a character. And yeah, there's there's probably, you know, a hundred times the number of jokes in it than there would be in a Thorne novel. Whether anybody laughs, we'll, we'll wait and see. But the fact that you're, sure you're laughing, people... that, that's got to be a good time. <laughs> Yeah, I laughed at all sorts. He's really, he's dry and him and, yeah, the way him and Hendrix bounce off each other. Yeah. You just. Oh, I love those things. Those are the, I mean, yeah, writing Nicklin is a joy. Uh, but whenever there's a Thorne and Hendrix scene, I just know I'm going to have, I'm going to have a good time. They're, they're in fact, this is making me think about the TV thing again, because in the dark, Hendrix was fantastic, but not like I pictured him. And actually, I don't, I've, I've never seen, I can't think of the actor's name off the top of my head. In he in, plays, in the Dark? Yeah. He's the actor, he's the actor who played... Uh, fantastic. He's the actor at Peep Show. He plays, um, you know, what do you call it in Peep Show? It's gone right out of my head. Somebody in the comments, tell me. You know, the legendary character in Peep Show, who isn't one of the main guys. I can't think what he is. And I can't, I can't think of Name, that's going to drive me mad. But no, I did when I was reading um, the murder book. I didn't picture him as Hendrix. I don't well, think I really picture anybody. There's been two Hendrix now on telly. There was the Hendrix in Thorn, who was an actor called Aidan Gillen, who was in The Wire and everything. And then we had the actor who played him in uh, in uh, in the dark, whose name has just gone out of my head. I'm so old. Um, and neither of them have been the Hendrix in my head at all. Um, I don't quite know. I don't quite know who I, who, who, who I, I don't, I mean, I have a slightly more, more a clearer visual idea of Hendrix just because he's, we know, we know some, we know he's got tattoos and we know he's got piercings yeah, yeah. and we know he's got a shape. So you instantly get a sort of idea of, of what he looks like. Thorn, still no idea. Still no idea what he looks like. It I doesn't think matter. for a long time I saw him as you. But then that obviously yeah. you learn to separate the author from the character and that changes. Yeah. But with the books, yeah. are there any books that you, not maybe a favourite book, but are there any books that you still think back to more than others for any particular reason? Um, I, st I still think about Sleepyhead a lot because it was the book that, you know, that got me my publishing deal. It was my first book. It's still a lot of readers' favourite book because a lot mm. of readers will go with the book they read first, and so quite and quite often it's that. Um, you know, you say not not having favourites, and you and you sort of don't. But I, I I'm very proud of L Love Like Blood, um, mm. which was a book yeah. I was very angry while I was writing it because of the subject matter, and I didn't know if that was going to mean it would turn out to be terrible or turn out to be okay. Um, and I'm very proud of Rabbit Hole. You know, even though. I I know some readers went not for me. It's not the sort of book they were expecting from me. But you can't, you can't just keep writing the same book. You know, you've got to do no, something of course different. Not. Um, which is I why. Am gonna... Sorry, carry on. Sorry, I was just going to say, which is why the book that's coming next, you know, is a re is another real left turn. Uh, you know, following the murder book because you've got to ring the changes in. Otherwise, I'm not going to stay interested. And if I'm not interested, sure as hell, the reader won't be interested. Oh. I want to know how you discovered Bardsey Island, which is a, a, a big setting in um, the Bronze Beneath. Well, that's an easy one, because if, if I remember, the dedication in that book says something like, to the little girl who fell asleep watching the lights from a lighthouse winking her across the bay. And that's my wife. She, mm -hmm. she was the one that... Well, I was talking to her about this idea I had for the book, and it was all about, I need a setting, I need this place that's kind of remote and inaccessible, uh, and even better if it doesn't have CCTV footage or, or a mobile phone signal. And she went, Bardsey Island. And I said, tell me about Bardsey Island. So she, and she told me, and not only did it tick all those boxes, it's also this really spooky place where it's supposed to be the, the resting place of like a thousand saints, the bones of all these saints. And it's got dark sky status and special scientific status. And it's got this weird lighthouse. And, and I went, let's go. Right. And, that, and that, so it's, you know, it's obviously it's off the Lynn Peninsula in North Wales. It's not easy to get to. We had to bribe the guy that drive, that, that does the boat out to clean the lighthouse. I had to give him a bottle of whiskey 
uh, and he took us out and, and I just spent the day walking around and it's got this spooky little church where people claim to hear the bells ringing when there's nobody there and dead sailors and ghosts and mm-hmm. and when it's dark boy it's dark and it was uh, it was just brilliant and from the moment I went there I knew that's where I was going to set the book or, or a large part of the book and yeah just because my wife knew it from when she was a little girl you know well, I loved it so much that me and my husband were on holiday with the kids in Wales and we took the four-hour drive to go down to Bardsley Island. Um, we had, it was a gorgeous day when we set off and by the time we got to, is it in Aberdaren? Ab- yeah, Ab- yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it Aberdaren? Um, yeah. By the time we got there, the fog had come in. So we didn't get to the island. Didn't Not get only to that, go. We couldn't, couldn't see the island. You could see one oh. tiny bit of outline. And there's nothing open. I mean, it took four hours down what felt like one of the longest roads in the world. It was longer than that. You know that road to Cornwall? Yeah. That one road that goes from, like, Bristol to Cornwall. So we had an amazing day, but the atmosphere was still incredible. Well, even when we went, the, even when we went the, 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 the guy run, running the boat said, I'll take you over there. I might not be able to bring you back because <laughs> you know, the tides changed so quickly. He said, you literally could be marooned out there till tomorrow. Um, but, it, yeah. It's a brilliant place. I've just remembered, incidentally, the guy that played Hendrix is the same guy that plays Super Hans in Peep Show, who's a kind of amazing character in Peep Show, if you like Peep Show. I can't remember his flipping name. But anyway, Super Hans. I'm surprised. Oh, someone Harris, Beverly's written. We'll, mm. we'll Google it in a minute. Be yeah. fine. Yeah, okay. Um, does pineapple belong on a pizza? I can't not ask you that. No, it's... Uh, and again, I think there's an exchange in the murder book. Where Thorne says, you know, it sh- it should be punishable. I mean, it should be. It, it... <laughs> Pineapple does not belong on a pizza. What is wrong oh, with it? Oh, so pizza? does. No, it's Sam. So no. on a pizza. Absolutely not. I will not. <laughs> is that an interview over? <laughs> That's yeah. That is going to tip me over the edge. Not Pineapple. as bad as you and the toast. I mean, we won't go into the toast debacle, but you know what? That caused such a thing. I just went. I bet on, you people. sold a lot of books off the back. Agree with me on toast. <laughs> toast has to be cold and crispy, not warm and bloody soggy. I don't anyway. know how it goes soggy. What What are you buttering? My toast is still crunchy. When no, I, I don't want. It. I don't want the butter to kind of melt. I want it. I mean, if you saw me making toast of a morning, wandering around the kitchen, waving these bits of toast <laughs> like I'm trying to land <laughs> to get them to cool down, and then when they're absolutely cool and crispy then i then i spread the butter on and the butter has to go to every bit of the bread every right around the edge has to be covered in butter then slathered in marmite that's breakfast that's breakfast oh, baby matt king matt king was who it was thank you who played Henry. yes okay <laughs> i don't know who actually commented that let's see facebook user but thank you somebody oh, loving hawaiian pizza. i tell you what people in hawaii don't love a hawaiian pizza that's just made up <laughs> nonsense do you think people you think in Hawaii thought they were oh. just chopping something else up? Yes, and a p- bit of pineapple fell on the pizza and so. Ah. <laughs> anyway, I was going to tell you about my favourite scene from the book as well, but I can't do that. But I'll tell you that afterwards. Oh. I don't think it's really a spoiler, but I think it's something that you should discover rather than. Do you know what I mean? Rather than mm-hmm. be told that it's going to happen, so I think it's a very moving moment. So, um, yeah. Have any of your jokes ever not been allowed in? Has your editor ever pulled something that you really wanted? Or is there something that you've managed to sneak in that um, you were really chuffed that got past the editor? One of the things I do, and it's and it's happened a lot with this new book that's coming next year. I know I should be talking about the murder book a bit more, but um, my editor said to me really early on, how old, how old is this character? And I went, oh, he's, you know, whatever, he's 40s. And, and when is it set? And I said, well, now, it's set now. And he said, but there are all these references that kind of age it. And I realise there are all these references that are just coming out of my head. Mm. And I imagine everybody understands. So, at what, you know, and there are some very young people working in publishing, very young. Uh, one of them had to Google the man from Del Monte. That's how young they are. No, I know, right? And I went, you seriously telling me people don't know who the man from Del Monte was? No, he didn't. So he had to Google it. Um, a few, I, John Craven. Do you remember who John? You know who John Craven was from um, TV. Craven. Yeah, News Round. But, news but, Round. Thank and, you. And Country File and everything. But I, I do. I realise their references I'm putting in that are really familiar to me, but that won't be necessarily familiar to somebody 25 years younger than me. So I do that a lot. I put things in thinking they're everybody will they're universal and they're just not. Um, 
No, Joe, I mean, jokes are such a weird thing. I mean, that's why this new book is so scary, because humour is such a subjective thing. You know, you mm. in thing like the murder, in a book like the murder book, there are bits of it that are horrifying. And I would imagine that anybody that reads it is horrified, because we're all horrified by the same things, or we kind of should be, you know. But humour, completely different. You know, yeah. you tell two people the same joke, and one person will roll around on the floor laughing, and the other person will just stare at you. So it's a very, it's a very tricky thing to get right. You have to walk a fine line. There's a, it's a very fine line as well, because something that you might think was funny 20 years ago could be the thing right. that cancels everything for you now. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to, Of course, you've got to be aware of that stuff. You've got to be aware that, that times change and tastes change and attitudes change. And, uh, you know, there are probably things I wrote in, a, in you know, the first couple of books that, you know, might not be looked on too favourably now. I'm just saying there might be. I can't think of anything. But off the I can't head, think of anything. You know, um, when you've been right when you've been writing for 20 odd years things have changed things do change and, and of course these days we have sensitivity readers and uh mm. you know readers to look at you know whenever you're writing about people from a different ethnicity or you know different sexuality or all that kind of stuff and i get that i understand that but it's the it's the, it's um, the world judith graham says i know someone who has never seen the four candles sketch four candles four candles i love Exactly. You just that's exactly Two the kind honest, of thing I would put that in. Victoria Ward. I mean, yeah. you can't go yeah, wrong, yeah. can you? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um somebody said she said he's still in his twenties, whoever it was. So yeah. it's holding to search YouTube. Just put it in yeah, Google, get on you will YouTube. find it anywhere. Candles My kids great. love the fact that I'm older yeah. than Google. You know, this is all this is all stuff. It is eight o'clock. I know. Hour I know. Has absolutely well. disappeared. I know. That's got to be a good thing, right? Absolutely. If, if you now look at your watch, you went, bloody hell, it's five past seven. Shit. How long has he been <laughs> droning on? No, it's good. It's, it's raced by Sam. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Thank you thank to everybody you to, who's, yeah, who's All the members who have been watching. And um, I hope I've got enough of your questions in. I was too excited. I've waited a long time for this, and you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. Cheers, Sam. Thanks a lot. It's grinning idiot time. Is well, it's grinning idiot. Okay. <laughs> Just before